I the only one wrong? Anybody, everybody else good? Okay, all right. Or maybe it's just the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. But listen, so we're talking about, we're teaching, we're ministering from this subject of receiving the life that God has called us to. Receiving, no, excuse me, we're, we're going to get a little bit into living that life, but we're talking about receiving the life that God has intended for us. Receiving the life that God has intended for us. And so just at, at a matter of uh, review, uh, we, we looked at uh, Isaiah 60, Isaiah 60, uh, verse 1, in the Amplified Translation, says that we are to arise, amen, we are to arise from the depression and prostration. To be prostrated is to lay, is to be laying down face, face down in, on the ground, right? Uh, but God is saying we should arise out of, we should arise from depression and prostration, listen, that circumstances have kept us. We are to arise from the depression and prostration in which circumstances have kept us, we are to rise to a new life. And so we've been uh, uh, speaking of this new life as actually the life that God intended for us, the life he originally designed and commissioned for us, amen? And so we, we are to be deliberate, we are to be intentional, we are to be aggressive in receiving that life, amen? We are to be resistant to any, uh, any, any, any condition, any circumstance that's not consistent with God's will for us, that doesn't fall in line with his original intent. So we have to know his will for us to be able to identify and distinguish between what he's intended and, and, and what he didn't. Amen? So, so <clears throat> we... we, we we, we, we are using this particular verse kind of as the, uh, the foundational text. And so we also looked at Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son. Uh, and we know his story. And in verse uh, 17 and around verse 18, we see, good evening, good evening, good evening. We see in verse 17 and 18 where uh, he came to himself, right? The prodigal son came to himself, right? Well, my, my question is, who was he before he came to himself? Amen? And, and, and see, I'm, 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 not, I'm not saying that to be facetious, but see, uh, you know how we hear the, the, that the word can have a sobering effect on us? We, we can become sober-minded by the word of God. So good to see y'all tonight. Praise God. <clears throat> Well, that's because, see, if, if it sobers us up, obviously we're under the influence. We're intoxicated. We're liberated, right, by the enemy. We're intoxicated by the enemy's lies, by the enemy's deception, right? And so really we're, 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 we're not our genuine self, right, because as a man thinketh, so is he. And, and, and so if we think of ourselves and believe of ourselves in a manner contrary to what God has said, then, then, then we, we will act in a manner contrary to who we are. And so we need to word to sober us up, right? And so the, so the prodigal son, uh, after coming to a place of where the evil circumstances, the famine that was in that land, right? Evil circumstances and conditions had weighed so heavily on him, right? That he was ready to eat the slop that he was there to feed the pigs. Are you following what I'm saying? And, and it's, it's interesting how oftentimes when we get, uh, we, we, can, we, we shouldn't have to, but, but, it's, but we, can, we can come to a point uh, where, where things are so bad that, that you just realize, now it's just got to be more to this thing than this, right? And usually in those moments, right, we're open, we, 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 we're sober enough to recognize that what we've been doing ain't working. And so, so we're, we're open and receptive 
there's a greater sensitivity and receptive and, and, and reception uh, to the word. Are, are you following what I'm saying? And, and so like this, this prodigal son, I, I believe that many of us, even now, dealing with whatever's going on in the earth, whatever present evil conditions that we're facing, right, uh, that we, we're, we're realizing uh, that, that life, uh, that, that God intended better for us. Amen. Amen. And, and so we're coming to a place as we grow in our knowledge and understanding of the word and we get greater light, greater revelation of, of the will of God, we're realizing, hey, this, this, is, this is not the will of God. And all of a sudden, it's no longer okay. It's no longer okay. It's no longer just something that we have accepted as life, as the norm, and that we have put up with and, and conform. No, no, no. No, we are realizing, oh, wait a minute. I'm, we're, we're seeing it. We're recognizing it for, the, for what it is. We're judging it illegal and unlawful. And so now we're taking uh, the position that God has about it, and we're now being resistant to it. Are you following what I'm saying? So, so, so we were contrasting then, well, maybe comparing and contrasting, uh, having a, a situation like in Isaiah 60 and 1 where we have to rise from out of depression and prostration that circumstances have kept us, right? And, we, and the only way we can get up out of that situation, right, is to come to ourselves. Or we can say it this way. We, we, one translation I'm told uh, says, instead of says he came to himself, he got a second thought. He got a second thought. And see, we got to understand the totality of our lives is simply uh, the summation of our most dominant thoughts, right? Our innermost, most dominant thoughts and belief, right? That, that's really, de de it, it, it's really depicted in our everyday lives and affairs, right? And so, so we're coming to a place uh, in the spirit, in our maturity, where we're realizing um, the will of God for our lives and we're no longer being acceptable, no longer accepting and tolerating uh, present conditions as we have it, right? And, and, I, and I think that's significant to mention because see, to me, that sounds like promotion and increase. That, that sounds like now that we realize this, there is a greater willingness to act and obey what God is saying. And, and so now with that willingness, there's a strength. With that willingness to obey and follow God, there's a strength and a grace to follow God. So now with that willingness to follow, there's a grace to endure and resist Satan's attempt to oppose us. Because you know he's not just going to sit idly by and let us walk into the best God intended. He will try to mount some type of opposition. He will try to oppose us. He will try to bring persecution, affliction for the word's sake. He will try to bring testings, trials, and tribulations right but but we are reminded jesus said don't worry about that in the world you're gonna have that but in me you got peace i got you right so with a greater willingness to follow god there's a greater measure of grace sustaining us and empowering us to actually walk out and walk through whatever opposition we encounter now to me that's good news because that tells me there is no circle i can stand in that's so great i can't break out of I cannot be contained, I cannot be restricted, I cannot be limited, I cannot be stopped. There is no set of circumstances that can come about that's greater than the one who lives in me. Are you understand what I'm saying? So, so, so that's, that's kind of where we've been, and, 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 and we've, also, we've also been discussing uh, the significance then or the importance of, uh, of understanding who we are in Christ Jesus, particularly as it pertains to our righteousness. We have to have a personal revelation of our right standing with God, of our acceptance by God, right? And so as we come to know who we are and grow in that revelation that we are God's righteousness, and, and understand that we're not his righteousness because we lived good enough to deserve it. We are his righteousness because we simply received his love for us. It's a free gift. Amen? And he made us righteous also that he could, he, so that he could share with us the portion that belongs to us. Are you following what I'm saying? So we've been talking about the significance and the importance 
of not only understanding that we are the righteousness of God, but also understanding the rights and privileges that come with being the righteousness of God. As his righteousness, there are rights and privileges that we have with him, right? Because we are in right standing with him. We are in covenant right standing with him. And with the right standing we have, there are rights and privileges. There are things that come with that. Amen? That, that listen, that, that belong to us. Right? We, remember, we, met, we, we, we discovered uh, yesterday in Mark 11, 24, what things soever you desire, right, when you pray, believe that you receive and you shall have. It didn't say whatever you desire when you pray, believe, you receive, and God will do it. It says you will have it. Because the truth is he's already done it. And he's already provided it for us. So it's not about him having to do it. It's about us having to receive it. And this is what we realize about that word desire, right? That word desire is not some passive word. It's some translations will say whatever you ask for in prayer. Well, that's taking away the strength of that word desire when you look it up in the Greek. In the Greek, it, it, it means whatever you make demand on, or it, it means to make a demand on something due. So, so if there, listen, if it's due, if you are do it, see, it belongs to you. It's yours. Not because you live good enough to qualify for it, but, but, but God loves us enough to give it to us. He, he established a covenant with us that would allow him, to. it would afford him, it would give him the legal grounds to show up and show out on our behalf, to be a God to us. So in our right standing, there are things that, that we're just do, that belong to us. So when you're praying now, don't, don't, when you're praying concerning things God has said in his word that is his will for you, things he has promised you, don't approach God in prayer in a way that, that don't approach from a standpoint that you're waiting to see if he say yes or no. No, you approach it from a standpoint that he's already said yes, that he's already given it, and you're placing a demand on what's yours. Are y'all following what I'm saying? And see, this, so there is a life, there is a quality of life, a reality God has prepared for us and keeps ready for us that is due us that we have to come to the knowledge and understanding of and take it. So, so we don't have to just go along to get along in the face of present evil conditions and circumstances, just trying to bide our time, hoping that things will get better over time. No, we cause things to get better because the truth is we have dominion over time. We don't have to wait until time progresses. We have mastery over time. And see, we as eternal beings, see, you, you got a right to everything God originally intended and designed. Even if by your faith he got to go backwards and grab something and bring it to your present. Or go to your future and grab something and bring it to your presence. Because you have dominion over it. Are y'all understand what I'm saying? You remember the situation with the South Phoenician woman who came to the disciples because of her, her daughter, what have you? And, and Jesus says, listen, I, I ain't come for you yet. It ain't time for you yet. I, I, it's, for the, it's the children's bread. It's the children's bread, right? And she said, yeah, Lord, I know it's the children's bread. I understand that. But I see something in you that lets me know that your love is big enough that I can eat from the crumbs that fall from the table. My point is, with her faith, she was able to receive something that wasn't yet time for her to have. Are y'all following what I'm saying? So we've been, that's, that's kind of where we've been digging at, and we've been looking at the importance of developing and maintaining a righteousness of God consciousness as opposed to a sin consciousness. And many of us in the body of Christ were operating from a sin consciousness, and by that I mean we're trying 
to live good enough to deserve what we're praying for. As though whether or not we get it is based on how good we perform. And the only reason we do that is because we're ever so mindful and conscious of our sin and our shortcoming. That we're trying to be deserving and worthy of what it is we're praying for. No, no. Righteousness of God consciousness has it's a completely different mindset. The righteousness of God consciousness, somebody with that type of consciousness, is someone that can stand in the presence of God, someone that can interact with God without any sense of fear, guilt, condemnation, or inferiority, without any sense of unworthiness, as though sin never existed. As though sin never existed. See, I don't want to get too deep into the review because we got some stuff we got to get to tonight. So, so I encourage you to, get, get, to, to go back and look at that. So, so here's something I want to I wanna, I wanna begin, I guess, uh, with, with tonight that we haven't said a lot about. And, 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 and that's this. See, another reason that, that having a righteousness of God consciousness is so important, so significant, is because God has actually called us. He's called us to a life of faith whereby we walk with him. He's called us to walk with him in covenant friendship. In covenant friendship. Amen? And so you cannot, you cannot be friends with God, intimate with God, trusting God, right? If, 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 you're, if you're thinking God looking at you sideways, if you, if you think you got to measure up and be worthy and deserving. Are you understand what I'm saying? So, so look, look at Genesis chapter seven, 17. Look at Genesis 17. Thank you, Lord. Genesis 17, look at verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Next verse, he says, I will make my covenant between me and you. So, so, so he's, he's, he's calling him to walk before him. That word before means in my presence, right? It's the, it, see, in my presence with me watching and approving your every decision. That, see, that, and so now you're getting into covenant. He's introducing covenant. He says, I want you to walk with me according to the covenant that I'm entering into with you. Are you seeing what I'm saying? He's, and he, listen, he tells him who I am. He, 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 he reveals to him who he is. He says, I am the almighty God. Now, in the Hebrew, we know that to be El Shaddai, the almighty God. Well, other definitions or meanings that come out of being of El Shaddai than, other than almighty God, it means the God who's more than enough. You are in covenant with the God who is more than enough. One translation, one, one definition says, the God of too much. So not only does he have more than enough, but he's too much. In other words, he, he got God, the, the, your covenant with God gives you access to more than you can see any way use. Now just think about all the uses you have for money. And your covenant gives you access to a measure and a supply that's beyond what you can see how to use. He's the God of too much. Another, another definition is he is the God of our sufficiency, the all-sufficient God, the many-breasty one. Right? And so we, we are sustained by the supply of his breast. He is our sufficiency, right? Now, the Amplifier says it this way. He says, he says, when it talks about what, he says, walk and live habitually before me. So he's talking about a lifestyle. He says, be perfect 
be blameless, be wholehearted, be complete. So, so, so in other words, so, so, so to be perfect is not to never make a mistake. To be perfect is to be genuine in your motives. To have a genuine and sincere motive in your walk with God. See, because none of us are perfect. Right? Even Job, the Bible says Job was perfect. It didn't mean Job didn't make mistakes because clearly he did. He put his hand to his mouth and repented and said, listen, forgive me, Lord. I've spoken of things that I know not of. So to be perfect is to have, is to be genuine and sincere of heart. And see, that's the key to walking with God. Having a genuine and sincere heart towards God. It's not about getting everything right all the time. But it's about wanting to. It's about endeavoring to. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's about wanting to be acceptable and pleasing with the life you're living. Right? We, see, see, our position in Christ, we're already accepted by him and the beloved in terms of who we are. But the life we're living, we want the life we're living, our everyday choices to be acceptable, to be pleasing, to be satisfactory. To, to be consistent with his plan and his purpose. Why? So that through us, his will is done here in the earth, even as it is in heaven. So God has called us. This is not just a little casual invitation. This is a summons. This is a call. Walk before me by covenant with me watching and approving your every decision. And see, we cannot do that with a sin consciousness. So we have to understand who we are as God's righteousness. We got to know what belongs to us. When we got to operate from a righteousness of God consciousness. Are you following what I'm saying? Yeah. All right. So, 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 so now let me just say this while I'm at it. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. So if, 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 if I'm going to walk with God, I must. Well, let me, let me even say it this way. We're talking about receiving the life God intended, right? We're talking about receiving, we're talking about having, we're talking about experiencing the will of God manifesting in our lives daily. How many of you know that God's will for you is good? Absolutely good and only good. God never intended anything but good for the family of man. Right? So to have the will of God manifesting in our lives is to have the goodness God intended manifesting in our lives. So we're talking about receiving the life God intended. We're talking about receiving his goodness. So in order to, to have and to experience the will of God, the goodness of God manifesting in our lives daily, we must commit to a life of faith. We must commit to a life of faith, a lifestyle of faith. Are you understand what I'm saying? Because see, see, listen, as the as the no other lifestyle is accepted. No other lifestyle is accepted by God. There's no other way we can live in, a, in an acceptable manner and a manner pleasing to God apart from faith. You're in Hebrews 11, right? Amen. Verse 6. Verse 6. But without, Well, let's back up a little bit to verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now that word please has to do with being accepted or satisfactory. So it was testified of Enoch that before God took him, he lived in a manner pleasing and acceptable unto God. When you go back and look at in, in Genesis, when, it, when it's giving you the lineage and, and Methuselah uh, lived before God. So when it comes down to Enoch, it says, it doesn't say he lived before God. It says he walked with God. The, the, I think it's in 5 verse 24. Uh, Genesis 5 24, somewhere around there. It, and the Amplified says that he walked in habitual fellowship with God. He walked, 
he lived, he conducted his everyday life affairs in habitual fellowship with God. And that's exactly what we're seeing in Genesis 17 that God has called us to. A life of habitual fellowship, of covenant friendship. And you can only do that by faith. You can't do that by how things look or how, how, how it feels. You can only do that according to what God is revealing to you through that word by his spirit. Right? So, so it was testified that Enoch pleased God, and we know that the way he was pleasing and acceptable unto God was by a life of habitual fellowship, right? And so then in verse 6 we see, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. It is impossible to live in a man acceptable to God. It is impossible to walk in habitual fellowship with God without faith. Why? Because, what does it say? Because he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I think it's 2 Chronicles 26, verse 3 through 5. It talks about, I think, Uzziah, how he reigned for 52 years. And it says this, because he sought the Lord, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. That's a life of faith. You can't seek God without faith, without believing that he is without believing and being confident that he has an answer for you, that he loves you enough to give it to you, that he wants you to have it, that he'll back you when you step out on it. No, you got to believe that he is everything God says he is, everything this book says he is, because you don't, you, you're not going to approach someone you don't believe, that you don't trust or have any confidence in. But we got to first believe that he is, and in addition, not only that he is, that he'll reward us for diligently seeking him, to know him, to live as he is commanding us. Are oh, you understand what I'm saying? So, so along the way in that process, there will be testings, trials, and tribulations. There will be opposition. See, when Isaiah 60 says, arise uh, from the depression and prostration in which circumstances have kept you, rise to a new life, uh, it's not to say that we won't encounter evil, negative circumstances. But in the event that we do, they shouldn't prevail over us and depress us and have us laid out on the ground. They, the, the circumstances are not to prevail. We are to prevail. And the only reason we don't prevail is, is, is because in most cases, we are reacting to the circumstances out, out of the flesh, out of human reasoning as opposed to responding to the circumstances out of our spirit according to Revelation. Reasoning would get us further in trouble, but Revelation would get you out. Reasoning is why you're dealing with them circumstances in the first place. And you understand? So now Satan is going to come steal, kill, and destroy. You understand what I'm saying? But, 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 my, but my, my point is, uh, when we encounter evil, contradictory circumstances, circumstances contradicted to the will of God for our lives, we cannot get, we can't do a knee-jerk reaction and, and react out of the flesh from reasoning, because Satan uses reasoning to corrupt wisdom. We have to respond, not react, respond with revelation given to us in our spirit. Are oh, you understand what I'm saying? So that denotes a relationship, fellowship, right? Because it ought to be, it ought to be, because the Bible tells us from the abundance of the heart, we're going to speak, we're going to act. So in the face of contradictory circumstances, there's, the, the pressure is such that there's not time to sit and think, okay, now what does scripture say? No, no. In the face of pressure, the pressure is so great that the mind shuts down in terms of having the time to try to think and remember. You just, you're going to, what's in you in abundance is going to come out your mouth and show up in your actions. And so if the word is not deposited on the inside, if we don't have a good deposit of revelation, knowledge, and understanding deposited on the inside, then, then our response is going to be one that's evil, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna bring forth evil things. But if, but, if, but if what's deposited on the inside of us in abundance is a revelation of God's word, then what's come forth will be good things. 
Notice it says, he bringeth forth. That means it's not existing, yet it bringeth. He bringeth on a continual, ongoing basis. You bringeth by the words you speak. Amen. Glory to God. You hear what I'm saying? Amen. By the words of your mouth, things come forth that are not. Amen. In other words, your circumstance changes it's overruled by what you speak and bring forth Amen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean think about that it's, it's not in manifestation yet it's not forth yet and it won't come forth until you bring it forth by speaking okay y'all follow what I'm saying so we got to commit then we got to be committed to a life of faith, right? Now, now let's go to Romans chapter 4. And let's look at this. Who better, who better to glean from to understand about this, this life of faith God has called us to, this walk with him he's called us to, uh, than Abraham, right? He is referred to as the father of our faith, right? So let's look at Romans 4 and look at verse 1. Romans 4 and 1, you there? Yeah. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? What did Abraham find? What, what, what did Abraham find out, right? Well, he found out how to receive from God in his everyday life affairs, right? He found out how to receive from God in his everyday life affairs as though sin never existed. Now you think about that and you go back and you read about his, his, Abraham's walk with God, right? There was no law, right? And without the law, see, sin was not known. Right? So, so people weren't held accountable to it. You, 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 wasn't, you understand what I'm saying? See, the law gave us a revelation and understanding of what sin is. But Abraham was called by God to walk with him in covenant friendship before there was a law. So he, he responded to that calling, not out of a legal obligation, but out of a, out of, it was a response to the love that he perceived in the call. So his decision to walk with God was based on believing what God promised him in the event that he would do it. Amen. So he chose to do it. See, when God went, 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 when, 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 when God promises you, or when anybody promises you something, and it's good, when somebody, somebody makes you a promise, then they are, they are communicating to you what their will is for you, what their desire is for you, what they're going to do for you. And so that promise is an, is an, it's an expression of their love towards you. Amen. So in the promise God made Abraham, he was expressing his love to Abraham, because, or Abram at the time, because, that, so, because, because what Abraham heard was, wait a minute, you mean to say, I no longer have to try to do it on my own? You will do it for me? All I have to do is, is let you be God, follow you, and you're going to make me rich? You're going to make my name great? You're going to make my name distinguished? You're going to increase me with an abundant uh, uh, increase of favor? And I'm going to be a blessing to the fans? Of the earth. You're going to do that for me? So, so, so his response was one out of... See, when you realize God loves you, you in turn love God. Amen. And see, I walk with God, and all we do in the service of God should be out of our love for God, 
not to try to fulfill a legal obligation. Are oh, yeah. you understand what I'm saying? So Abraham found out how to receive from God in, in everyday life as if sin never existed, and, and he did it by faith. In other words, believing what God promised and obeying what God commanded. See, every, we, we, we get excited when we hear about the promises of God, the exceeding great and precious promises of God, right? And rightfully so. But sometimes we fail to realize that the promises, see, the love of God is unconditional. The fulfillment of the promises are conditional. They are tied to us keeping the commandment. God promises that it shall be given unto us. Good measure, press down, shaking together, running over. But that's tied to us fulfilling the commandment to give. He promises I open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you don't have room enough to contain, but it's tied to the commandment to give. See, 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 so, 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 so Abraham found how to receive and experience God manifest himself in his life, right, as though sin never existed, and, 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 the, and, the, and, and it was by faith. It, he, he learned how to walk with God by believing what God promised and obeying what God commanded. Amen. Are you understand what I'm saying? And I mean, that's simple. The... the, the the, the, the best that God has for us is on the other side of obedience. Are you understand what I'm saying? And here's the thing we got to understand. I'll just plug this in right here. Uh, prosperity, particularly, uh, particularly, uh, particularly financial prosperity. It, it does not answer or come as a result of our prayers, it does not come as a result of, of our fasting, of our confessing the word. Prosperity comes as a result, it's, it comes as a result of us keeping covenant with God. Prosperity answers to covenant. Now, now praying to God concerning our needs met, well, what, what that does is, now, now God will speak to us and direct us and instruct us. But what is that? That's covenant. He will talk to us about what we're doing that's preventing it. And he'll instruct us in what to do that will release it. And those instructions, that's a commandment, that's covenant. And as we respond in faith to what he's saying, we're now, we're now walking with him in covenant friendship. And, and the covenant, our, see, God's going to do his part of the covenant. And as we fulfill our part of the covenant, prosperity answers to covenant. It's a matter of covenant. Now, I'm, 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 I'm oh, I'll get back to that later. I'll get back to that later. I'll get back more of that later. Remember that, though, it's a matter of covenant because, because see, 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 what we get caught up in sometimes is doing and acting as it seems like the situation demands. But what we need to do is, is doing and acting as the covenant demands. That's, 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 whole, that's a whole different thing right there, right? All right, so what has Abraham found, right? All right, so he found out how to receive from God, right? Uh, and, and, and have God's goodness in his everyday life by faith, as though sin never existed, as though sin never existed, right? So if we keep reading, right, uh, let's come on down, um, look at verse 2. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory. He got a reason to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. In other words, it was credited unto him as being righteous because he believed God. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. 
but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, or he, his faith is the reason he is credited with righteousness. He's not credited with righteousness because he earned it with good works or by keeping the law, but he is credited with righteousness as a result of his faith because he believed. All right? All right, so, 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 so look at verse 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. That's us. That's us. We are the righteousness of God independent of works. And so David describes this as a state of blessedness. Hallelujah. Glory to God, right? Okay, he goes on. He said, so as David describes the blessedness of man unto whom God imputed righteousness without works, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. We saw that last night in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. That, that God was in Christ Jesus. He didn't impute the sins of the world to, to us, but he imputed them to Jesus. Man, he held Jesus accountable and judged him guilty for sins he never committed. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Past, present, future sins already accounted for to God's satisfaction. He saw the suffering, the anguish, the travail of Jesus, Isaiah 53, and was satisfied. Satisfied the penalty has been paid. And so now he's pronounced judgment on us and he's judged us righteous. His rightness. Yeah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, bless your name, Jesus. See, see the reason that you got to, it's important to understand that. Uh, because sometimes, have you ever, have you ever uh, found yourself thinking about something, uh, having something, enjoying something, uh, only to, to, to have it countered with another thought, well, you know, that's too big, that's too good, you ain't, you ain't qualified for that, you ain't did this, you ain't that. And, and some, it, in other words, it, it, we, 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 Satan will give us somebody else that, that, that said, well, you know, they, they can get that, they're deserving it. Look, after all, look at them, look what they've done, look, what, look who they are. But that's too big for me, that's too good for me. Have you ever had a situation like that where you found yourself thinking that, well, maybe I need to dial it back because, you know, after all, that's just, I'm not, no, 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 that's a mistake. See, God gave you his best. He gave us his best when we were at our worst. He gave us Jesus. And the Bible says, how can he not with Jesus freely give us all things? So there's no, there's no thing that we can desire from God that's, too, that's so good that it's too good that we don't deserve it. We are deserving of it, not because we live good enough to earn it, but we are deserving of it because of, of our identity in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. So there's nothing that's so good that is too good for you to deserve. Are you understand what I'm saying? And there's nothing that's so good that it's too good that it's too hard for God to do. There's no situation you can find yourself in that God can't get you out of in 24 hours. 24 seconds. I mean, you, know, you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so look, 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 look. Verse 8 again, blessed is the man, blessed is the man to whom the Lord would not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Was he credited with being righteous when he was uncircumcised or after he was circumcised? And the answer is he was credited with being righteousness before he was circumcised. Right? Because of faith, because he believed. Right? Uh, he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised. He received it while he was still uncircumcised. 
that, so that he might be the father of all them that believe. See, Abraham is referred to as the father of our faith, the father of all them that believe, right? Though they be not circumcised, so that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. He is the father of all that believe, even those who are not circumcised. If they believe, regardless of circumcision, Abraham is the father of all that believe. Right? So that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Now look at verse 12. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham. So Abraham is the father of all who walk in the steps. The steps of that faith of our father Abraham. Or we could say the father of all those who walk by faith like Abraham. The father of all those who walk with God by faith like Abraham did. Are y'all following what I'm saying? So, so, so now listen, 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 listen now, listen now. We who believe, right, we walk by faith. We live, we walk habitually by faith every day and every day we receive from God. We, did you hear that? We, we walk by faith daily in covenant with God. So if we walk by faith in covenant with God, on a daily basis, then that covenant gives us access to God's goodness on a daily basis, which means we can receive from God's goodness on a daily basis. Daily. Daily. And it's, 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 so I'm, say daily. Say, say daily bread. There's a verse that says he daily loaded us with benefits. Daily, right? So, so, so us experiencing goodness is not uh, predicated on a particular date on the calendar because our covenant allows us to walk with God daily and receive daily from God. So we can experience God's goodness in our lives on a daily basis. We can receive and experience financial increase daily, not just the first and the 15th. So you don't have to wait to, to, to what the system de uh, determined as payday to be paid. Because in the kingdom, every day is payday. You have access to God every day. Whatever it is you're, you're in need of, it are, it's already yours by virtue of covenant. But we got to understand the will of God for us in every situation, in every circumstance, so that we don't accept and receive conditions and circumstances God never intended. We got to be able to identify and distinguish the difference between what God intended and what's just showing up or being offered, even maybe by the enemy, on, 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 you know, in deception. Remember, everything that is given to you or presented to you, just because it's coming and it's a gift don't mean it's God. Proverbs says, be aware of that dude that set that good food before you because his heart is not with you. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So some people might do something that seems good, but don't have good motives and intentions towards you. So the Spirit of God will let you know and, and you'll discern and perceive that. So don't just automatically say, oh, it's free, it's free. Everything free ain't God. And there's a cost on it on the back end. Okay, where we at? Verse 12. Let's drop on down to verse 21. I'm working my way down to chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. That's where we're headed. But look, let's look at verse 21, right? So then, still talking about Abraham, 
being fully persuaded. Now, we know, if, if you read in the scriptures, Abraham didn't start off fully persuaded, but he became. He came to a place of being fully persuaded, right? Being fully persuaded, what he had promised, he was fully persuaded that what God promised, God was able to perform, right? That, that's, that's a big part in walking with God. You got to be persuaded that what he's promised, he's able to do and that he's willing to do. See, where the will of God is known, faith begins where the will of God is known. That's a statement, write that down. Faith begins where the will of God is known, but it ends where the question mark shows up. Faith begins where the will of God is known, but it ends where the question mark is. In other words, whenever you have a question as to whether or not something is God's will for you, faith ends with the question. With the, que the question has to be resolved with a yea or nay for faith to continue. Are you understand what I'm saying? See, that's why he said, he, he, he said, okay, let, 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 me, let me slow that. All right. So, so the, look, 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 back, back, back. Forth. So, he, so verse 21, and being fully persuaded what he had promised, he was, that he was able also to perform it. And therefore, it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Now, listen. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed unto him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Now let me just read that from the Amplified Classic translation. The Amplified Classic, verse 1. Fully satisfied and assured that God was able and mighty to keep his word and do what he promised. That is why his faith was credited to him as righteousness, right standing with God. But the words it was credited to him were not written for his sake alone, but they were written for our sakes too. Righteousness, standing acceptable to God, will be granted and credited to us also who believe in, trust in, adhere to, and rely on God who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was betrayed and put to death because of our misdeeds and was raised to secure our justification, our acquittal, making our account balance and absolving us from all guilt before God. See, that's that righteousness of God consciousness, to be able to stand in the presence of God without any fear, without any guilt, without any condemnation, shame, embarrassment, sense of unworthiness or inferiority, as though sin never existed. Why? Because you have a covenant with God that allows you to have God treat you as though you never sinned. Why? Because he's absolved you of the guilt. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. I mean, have you ever been out to a meal with somebody and, um, and, and, and or, or maybe, maybe you was with somebody else, a group, and somebody said, well, look, let me get that for you. I'm going to pay for this. Or maybe, it was, you know, somebody, you know what's really fun when you go somewhere and just be listening to God. God, but God may say, go bless that couple right there. You get the way to say, Psst, pay for this, but don't tell, them, don't tell them who it was. If they ask any questions, just tell them that said the Lord loves them. You see them looking around. They're happy, they're excited. Why? Because the bill was paid, so they don't owe anybody for it. Now, what they look like getting up trying to pay for it again? And that's what Satan is trying to do from us. He's trying to extract additional payment from us that Jesus already paid to God's satisfaction. So the same way that cashier is not going to charge you again or demand payment again, God is not demanding anything from us to be accepted by him. Right. That's right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, so now let's go, to, go into chapter 5. Look at, look at verse 1 and 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, 
by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now, let, let, let me read that from the Amplified Classic, verse five, verse, chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we are justified, we are acquitted, we're declared righteous, we're giving a right standing with God through faith. Since that's true, let us grasp the fact that we have the peace of reconciliation to hold and to enjoy. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Through him also we have our access, our entrance, our introduction by faith into this grace, this state of God's favor. We have access into a state, a reality of God's favor. Now remember... Isaiah 61, rise from the depression and prostration in which circumstances have kept you, rise to a new life, to the life God prepared for you, intended for you. What is that? This state, this state of favor. That's what God originally intended for you, a continual, constant state of favor with God. And, and the covenant entitles you to that favor daily. No matter what circumstances, what conditions you are confronted with, you have favor with God and favor with all men. And the favor you have with God will literally move God to divinely influence the hearts and minds of others to deal favorably with you, even if they don't understand why. So, so you got to be mindful of that so that in the face of contradictory circumstances, evil circumstances, you don't accept it just because you in your mind don't see a way out. Recognize you got a covenant with God and you have access to a wisdom of another realm that will show you the way out. That if necessary, God just changed the laws, the, the, the standard, the protocol just for you. Just for you. I remember, I remember Pastor Davis was telling me this one time when he, 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 well, he's a basketball fan. You know, a lot of times he used to have the ACC tournament down in Greensboro. Years ago, you know, he first started walking with God. He wanted to go to the ACC tournament. Didn't have the money, you know, for a good seat, whatever, right? He said, now he praying about this thing. See, he praying about this thing. He, so he says, he says Lord, I, I, I want, you said whatever I desire. Believe I receive it, I have it. So I'm thanking right now for, for a seat at this game. He says, the Lord says, get up and, and go down to the Coliseum. Get in line at the Coliseum. He drives, he goes, he gets in line at the Coliseum. Don't have no money in his pocket for the ticket. He's moving up. He's moving up closer and closer. And finally, he's at the, at, the ticket, at the ticket gate. And say, yeah. And this is what he said. The Lord told me to come down here. I want to see the game. Somebody said, step right over there. Step out of line right over there. He stepped out of line to where he was directed. He's standing there. Somebody comes from around the corner. Follow me. Take him around the corner. Take him into a side door. Usher him right down to the... To, uh, court side <laughs> see this is the God we serve That's right. but 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 now how many of us are willing to trust him enough to act on that because see that had that that's gonna risk you looking real foolish oh, yeah. that's gonna risk you looking real foolish and if Satan can get you caught up in the how it's going to look, he'll stop you and you will never get up out of your circumstances. And you'll just miss out on what God already provided you. But, it, but, but as we're endeavoring to get to know him better and better and better, what happens is we develop more and more trust. So then when those thoughts come to us, get up and go do this, even though reasonably it sounds stupid, 
we can pick up on the inward witness from the Holy One. Okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to act on this. And, and, and that's how you arise out of your current situation and circumstances to the new life, the real life that God intended. You got to trust God. You got to be willing to, to let go of, you can't lean to your own understanding and go with what's reasonable. You have to lean completely on God and trust him, especially when it's unreasonable. Check it with the word. Make sure it's consistent with the word. And you got a witness in your uh, a peace in your spirit. It might not make sense in your head, but if there's an inward witness inside in, 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 your, in your spirit. Are you understand what I'm saying? My, my, my wife, my wife, when we were when we you know, first accepted the pastorate here, we commuted for the first year and a half from Richmond. Coming in on Wednesdays, coming in on the weekends. And we got to realize, you know what? And there was a grace to do that. There was a grace. I can make that drive, man, I mean, with, with at ease. Right? But then if, 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 if we began to realize, you know what, it's time to actually move there. All right, so now my wife, my wife works in Richmond. She's still employed by the same people. What is it? Department of Criminal Justice System for the state of Virginia? The office is in Richmond. So we're praying about this thing. And then, now, now, so she gets a thought, a prompting, an idea. Hmm. Why don't you write up a proposal for your director pointing out the benefits of you being housed in, in Southwest Virginia? See, the nature of her job, you, you, she went to the office three days a week, but she worked from home two days a week. So she wrote, wrote up the proposal, took, took it to her boss, and pointed out the benefits of, 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 of having representation in this, area, in this part of Virginia. And, 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 and the director approved it and, and gave it up to her boss. And her boss approved it. And sent it up to the one after that. And I think that one was, was new, right? That, that was a new guy recently on, on the scene. And the word was he was not a, a proponent of, of working from home. But he signed and okayed hers and didn't sign no more. That's favor. She had another supervisor. Who, who appreciated and recognized the value of her work and went to bat for her to get a raise. And so her supervisor went to the person that's, that you're supposed to go to if you want to request a raise for somebody uh, uh, that you oversee. And told her that she went to the person. Some time go by, she asks her, have you heard anything about your raise? No, I haven't. Well, go and check with so-and-so. She goes and check with so-and-so. So-and-so so -and -so says, oh, yeah, I, I, I submitted that up to the head director, but I hadn't heard anything yet. They lied. They hadn't said nothing to the head director. And the way she found out is because she, had, she was called to a meeting with the head director later on along with her supervisor. And, and, and the supervisor asked her, what about her raise? She said, I have received no notification for her to get a raise. But I'll fix it right now. So she got the raise. And then they had some changes where the dude who was supposed to request the raise for it and lied about it. They, they terminated his position. And if he wanted to remain employed, he had to accept a position that would put him under my wife. You can't mess with God's people, man. You can't. See, see now some of us would have, you know, we would have we'd we'd reacted out of the flesh and, 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 and gave somebody a piece of our mind. Right? See, when you, when you step out of love, though, faith don't work. You get into offense and strife, Satan can take us captive at will. Yeah, we would have felt good for a few minutes because we, we told him all. But then what? But see, when you, when, you, when you enter into a place of rest, trusting in God and keep walking in love, God got you. See, see 
So it's never about how it looks. It's about your covenant. See, and, and listen, I, I said earlier, where the will of, where the, where the, where the will of God is, faith begins where the will of God is known, but it ends with the question mark. You got to know the will of God for your life. You got to know the covenant, what your covenant rights and privileges are. But you also got to know what your covenant responsibilities are. Because it's a mutually benefit covenant between us and the Father. See, so listen, you got to know the will of God, but it's not enough just to know God's will. See, so because the, the good God wills for you to have is not going to show up just because you know it's his will for you to have it. No, it happens to the degree that we cooperate with God within the context of any given situation as our covenant demands. Hallelujah. So in the situation I just used with my wife's illustration, the, what does the covenant demand? Walk in love. Pray for them that, 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 that despitefully use you and lie on you and talk about you, right? So the covenant demanded a certain response that she honored, which allowed God's grace, the favor, to flow, and he worked it out without any toil or sorrow on her part. So it's not enough to know it's God's will. We got to know what the covenant demands of us in that particular situation and then cooperate with God. That's what it means to walk with God in covenant friendship. Glory to God. Well, it's after eight, so I guess I'll stop right there. I, I guess I'll stop right there. I guess I'll stop right there. I'm just listening to my spirit. I guess I'll stop right there. Uh, I'll say this, though, and I'm, I'm stopping. Uh, uh, The, the, the life God intends for you is a life where God is daily manifesting himself to you and on your behalf. That's true prosperity. And that's the result of us doing as the covenant demands or as he commands. Remember what Jesus said in John 14, right? If you love me, keep my commandments. Then you get down to verse 21. He says, those that love me, keep my commandments. He said, the Father, I will come and will manifest ourselves to you and when you got God manifesting himself his goodness to you and on your behalf it don't get no better than that it don't get no better than that amen let's stand to our feet